Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in our time together. We just finished it last week with the resurrection, Paul talking about that. And we begin a new chapter, a new letter, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And just remembering that Paul was talking to a church that was fractured and divided and competing and at each other's throats and not really showing the Christian love <laughs> that, that Jesus died for. And, uh, but they were trying to speak, seek spiritual heights of their own, but very competitively and individualistically. And uh, it just really was kind of a mess. The, uh, Paul loved the Corinthians. He loved the Corinthian church, which he founded. But uh, he didn't... Uh, they, let's just say they were high-maintenance kind of people. Uh, the two letters that we have aren't the only letters that scholars think that were written. In fact, we have a reference in, in the first two chapters of 2 Corinthians to a letter of tears that he talks about. A hard letter, a difficult letter emotionally, spiritually for everybody. Um, but we think there were other letters also. Who knows? Um, it was kind of an ongoing kind of deal. Paul would be uh, trying to bring them back into the main course of what it means to live in the kingdom, to live for Jesus Christ, to live in his power. And uh, I think it's good for us too because we all, we all have little Corinthians wandering around insides of us, you know, and, and we don't get it right. We, we need that kind of correction from the Word of God to kind of set our course straight again. And one of the things the Corinthians were all about is they, they thought they had it all figured out. They, they had kind of their plan, uh, probably a lot of different plans, but they thought they had it all figured out. And Paul is over and over again, at least in the first letter, but we'll see it in the second letter too, over and over and over and over again, Paul is coming back to God has a much bigger vision and a, and a very different kind of vision for you. It's, and it's filled with surprise. It's filled with an eye-opening kind of experience going, oh my goodness, is this what it's all about? And that sense of surprise and awe was lacking in the Corinthian church. And Paul was trying to open that up for them. Um, and, and I think we need that too from time to time. For example, what would you think about starting a new church, a new church or a new church ministry Partnering with an atheist. What would you think about that? Starting a new church, partnering with an atheist. Well, the pastor that you're about to hear, we've got a little two-minute segment of a pastor who walked into a coffee shop in Denver, Colorado and had a most unusual conversation that started him off on a pathway to growing an international church and church ministry. His name is Pastor Ulmer. I wrote a book called Cross Vision, uh, which has uh, been an amazing read for me, and I know for Kirk, and uh, looking at the cross. But Greg is interviewing this Preston Ulmer who came to uh, Denver, Colorado, and uh, walks into a coffee shop and has this conversation with an atheist coffee, owner, coffee shop owner who says... Uh, are you going to start a church? And he says, I think, I think you should. And they end up coming together and they do create a friendship and they pursue truth and the fellow becomes a Christian uh, through the openness. You know, what was it he, that he said? He said, I'd come to a church that um, allowed you to ask questions and uh, I don't know, it was open, didn't judge you or something like that. Um, what a concept. And so, God works in mysterious ways, you know. Um, you never know how He's going to be operating or what He's going to be doing, but He's always in the business of restoring lives, bringing lives into kingdom living, which is creating friendships, as Preston put it, creating fr friendships and pursuing truth. What a powerful combination creating friendships and pursuing truth together. Um, and not, not in some 
formula kind of way or defending the faith or whatever, but it's just allowing, allowing God to be God and to work in that relationship and see where it takes you. And so Paul is doing some similar things with the Corinthians, trying to say, you know what? God's going to work in some different ways in your midst. And can you have the eyes to see a new picture of God? Can you put your frames down where you're framing God, each one of you? Can you put your frames down for a moment and allow God to speak for himself? Can you do that for a little bit? And we do that typically as human beings. We, we frame God, and God is framed in our frame. Some of us have bigger frames than others. And Paul is asking the Corinthians to, please, put down your frames, and let's take a fresh look at who God is through the lens of Jesus. And there were some things that popped out to me. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2. If you want to crack open your Bibles, um, to... Take a look at at least a few things that popped out at me, but I'd like to hear what kind of pops out at you in these first two chapters. And next week, by the way, we'll crank out a couple more chapters, three and four, um, if you want to look ahead. But it's, it's looking at God through a whole new set of lenses. And there's a challenge to us also. I mean, I was raised in the church. Maybe you were too. But And maybe there are frames that worked for you as a child or growing up or whatever But just for a moment, to be able to take a fresh look at who Jesus is, who God is, because he just may surprise you. The first theme that jumped out at me, and I'm just going to read the passage, this is just a few verses, but I'm going to see if you can pick up on what the theme is here. Um, And this is from the New American Standard, but you may have it in your translation too. Um, I'm going to start at uh, verse 3 and go through verse 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also we comfort, our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that you are sharers in our sufferings, so also you are sharers in our comfort. So what word keeps kind of (laughs) popping up? (laughs) It's multiple choice. (laughs) Fill in the blank. The word comfort. The word comfort. And a lot of times when you walk to somebody or talk about God with somebody, uh, on the streets, you know, and, and you ask, well, what's, what's a word that occurs to you when I say the word God? I doubt that they would say the word comfort. You know, unless you've actually had an experience of God comforting you, you'll think of other things, lawgiver, God, you know, keeping, keeping you in check, um, punishing you when you're bad, rewarding you when you're good, um, whatever. You know, people have all their ideas. But the God of comfort is to think about that word and how God operates to comfort us, to bring us comfort. Um, Let me try to give you a a feel for the Greek word. Um, I need somebody to play God for just a second. Any volunteers? No pressure. Come on. Okay, Pooh, come here. Come here, Pooh. Play God for just a second. Come, this won't be painful. You're with friends. Okay. <laughs> okay. Pooh's going to be God. I want you to stand right here. Stand right here. Try to look like God, okay? Yeah. 
Thank you. I'm sure that's what God looks like. Pious. Um, okay, I'm, I'm walking along and I'm burdened down. I've, I've got suffering stuff going on inside. Relationships falling apart. Um, all, just bad stuff fall in my life. I'm out of money. Um, even my dog doesn't like me. Yeah, I've been there, done that. So, so I'm all burdened down, and I'm walking along, and feeling really alone. Okay, well, that's, that's the idea. You're getting it. Okay, you come alongside me, put your arm around me, oh, and walk with me. It's going to be okay. Really? Mm -hmm. Can I have ten bucks? You can have anything. I got hundred dollars you can have. Oh, thank you. That's it. Let's have a hand for Pooh. Yeah. Her, her role in playing God on, in church on Sunday. That's what God does. That's the, that's the word comfort. That's the Greek word. That's the New Testament word. We've talked about this before. It's uh, to be called alongside. And God calls us alongside or he comes up alongside of us. And it's that idea that he puts his arm around us and begins to speak encouraging words to us. Did you notice I asked her 10 bucks and she said, how about 100? That's how God operates. That's what he does. That's the God of all comfort. We, we want just this tiny little bit. God, just help me to survive. And God says, I'll show you even more. I'll show you how to thrive, how to walk victoriously through this. You want 10 bucks, God says, how about 100? How about 1,000? How about a million dollars? You know, God wants to show us what this abundant life is all about. It's, it's living in the kingdom. It's living in his kingdom and the God of all comfort. Because comfort isn't, you know, we think, ah, oh, that's, that's kind of a namby-pamby word. Not really, not with God. Because when God comforts us, it builds us up. It builds up the body of Christ so that we have the confidence to be able to walk and stand tall and that we allow the power of God to flow through us to change our environment, to change our circumstances. So comfort becomes something very, very powerful. But Paul's trying to get this across to the Corinthians. It's not your own self-made theologies and things like that. The, the frames are too small. It's too small to allow God to come to you in some new ways to surprise you. Well, you yes, even comfort. Maybe it'll be kindness. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 2, about the kindness of God. Namby-pamby, I don't think so. Not with God. God uses, how about love? Eh, you know, I want power, you know. God says, I'll show you power. And he, and he goes up on a cross and changes the trajectory of a universe that's power. But it's all flip-flop. with It's different with God. And the, the sooner we get this in our minds, that God's kind of thinking is very different from our thinking, then that will begin to create, like we said, that capacity for Him, that openness for Him to come in and surprise us. Or as C.S. Lewis would say, surprised by joy. That God will surprise us with His presence if we're open to it, if we create that space for him, that welcoming space. So that's one thing that jumped out at me was the comfort thing. But in verse 5, too, there's another loaded kind of meditation point where it says, he says, just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. The sufferings of Christ. And there's something, and I'd like you to think about this as we work our way through Corinthians that one of the surprises that God gives to us is that when we get in Christ, when we are in His presence, that He changes our viewpoint on suffering. He changes our viewpoint on suffering. Now, none of us like suffering, right? We run. You know, suffering's over here. We go 180 degrees over there. That's human. That's natural. None of us like suffering, except for those, well who are in therapy um, or other things. It's just, that's not a natural thing. But we create a lot of our own suffering. I mean, some people would say we create all of it. I mean, it's not about pain. Whoops. Five-string guitar now. Uh, it's not about pain because we all experience pain. But it's, it's the suffering on top of that, the anxiety, the dis-ease, 
all the stuff that goes along with it, all the, all the storylines that we create in our minds, the worry and the, and the anxiousness, all that stuff, that's the suffering part. But there's something about participating in the suffering, and Paul will talk about this throughout his letters. There's something deep about participating in the sufferings of Christ. And what are the sufferings of Christ? It's all the stuff that he took upon himself. The brokenness, the hurt, the sin, the darkness, all of the junk that the world had to throw at him. He took that upon himself. And could Paul possibly be saying that when we live in the presence, the abundance of Christ, the comfort of Christ, the joy of Christ, the peace of Christ, the, the, the wonder, the awe of living in the power of God, the resurrection, that part of that package is a greater sensitivity, even a participation in the sufferings that are around us. Not just ours. I mean, maybe there's greater clarity too in ours, but there's a connection, a participation in some way. And it's not just us, you know, trying to connect with people because we're trying to take care of everybody and fix everybody and all of that stuff. That's not what it means to be in Christ. It's a different deal. To be in Christ through His sufferings, through His connection, because it's not just the cross. The cross gave us a demonstration of what God's been doing for eternity, right? God's always connecting with people's sufferings. I mean, you can pick that up in Genesis before the flood, you know, where God feels deeply the brokenness and sufferings of His people. Is there an invitation there for us? It sounds scary. I mean, I mean, you think about people around you. Think about some people who are broken or suffering or going through some really kind of tough times and you think, glad I'm not them, you know. Well, maybe there's a different viewpoint that in Christ, that the deeper we get into Him, it's not only resurrection power, but it's, they use, He uses the word koinonia. There's a koinonia, there's a sharing of the sufferings of others in our lives. And you think, I can't do that. I'll be dragged down. You know, I don't want them dragging me down. But in Christ, you have, that's the primary connection. In Christ, you have the power. And it's not you trying to fix people. This is not fix it stuff. This is allowing the power, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ to flow through you to somebody else. It can happen through prayer. It can happen through touch. It can happen through a face-to-face -face meeting, a phone call, a letter, whatever connection or whatever mode that is. But that possibly, possibly God is inviting you to connect with the sufferings of somebody else in your sphere of influence. Just something to think about. Because that's how God operates. He wants us to step outside of our comfort zone and see just how big a God He really is. So that's something that caught, caught me there in first, verse 5. Not only the God of all comfort, but uh, also the God who invites us into His sufferings. Uh, verse 19 and 20 caught me. Yeah. Yes. Not sympathy, but empathy. But empathy, yeah. Empathic, yeah. Yeah, it's like empathy. But not on your own strength. And that's where we get caught sometimes, where we try to do this stuff and empathize just, you know, because that's how we are. We're em empathic people, empaths. But uh, no, this is, this is a connection, a partnership with Christ. It's like watching, see what the Holy Spirit is doing and ministering to somebody within our sphere of influence and then partnering, being invited into working with Jesus on what He's already doing rather than us generating something. Oh, I need to save this person. Oh, I need to help them. You know, nice impulse, but it doesn't typically work out. Um, but yeah, empathy. Verse 19 and 20 caught me. For the Son of God 
Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in him. For as many are the promises of God, in him they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. Just further reinforces the idea, this whole notion of good news. When Jesus preached good news, it actually is good news. It's a yes in somebody's life. And it's interesting, I heard a criticism of Christianity by someone um, in an interview one time, and the person said, I, I understand everything that you Christians are against. You know, drinking, dancing, um, swearing, um, whatever. And the, the list goes on and on and on. I understand all the things that you're against, but what are you for? And, I, you know, and I'm not saying that this person understood. or, you know, But this was an interesting comment. But what are you for? And what if we were known for our yes instead of our no? And it's not that you aren't supposed to have boundaries, you know, moral boundaries and things like that. But what if we were actually known for not the no's, but the yeses? Or maybe the, the major yes in our lives, the capital Y yes. What if we were known for the yes? What if we were living as this refers to, Paul refers to the promises of God in Christ. That we, our lifestyle was a fulfillment or a re response, you might say, just like it says here, the amen. That our lives could be a living amen, moment by moment. Not that we're perfect. I mean, we screw up uh, majorly. But that overall, that people would know us as, a, as saying an amen, which means so be it, which means yes, I confirm it. That our lives confirmed living in the promises of Jesus Christ, no matter how hard things got in our lives or how crazy stuff gets or how reality gets blown apart because we're holding up this framework for reality and, and God's going way beyond it or life is going way beyond it and exploding our frames and it's all sorts of chaos. And even in the midst of all that swirling stuff going on in our lives, we have this a sense of groundedness that but the promises of God are true. Now, I may not have a handle on all of them, or I may wonder what's going on, but I trust the one who holds my life in his hands. His promises are true. And our lives become a yes to a whole new way of living, a whole new way of thinking. And this is what Paul's trying to get across to these Corinthians, that it to live lives not as divided and competing and at each other's throats and all this stuff, but to live a life that's full, that's a yes to the positive, wonderful action of the Holy Spirit, the unsinkable love of Jesus Christ. What if we could do that? What if the Corinthians could have done that? They did that to some extent. But what if we could do that in this life to live out that yes in Him? Okay, looking at uh, second chapter. Like I said, there's a, a reference in the fourth verse there to the tearful letter. And obviously there were other letters that were written to the Corinthians. There's probably this ongoing... I mean, if Paul had had a cell phone, he'd be on his cell phone all the time or text messaging the Corinthians. You know, it's kind of like, you might want to think about things this way. How about this? Uh, in the early part, they're talking about there was a guy who is, uh, who is acting immorally in the Corinthian church from the first letter. And uh, they kind of expelled him or, or he left or there was a mutual decision. But anyway, he was no longer part of the community. And uh, he had since asked forgiveness and been, had, cha had a change of mind, a change of heart and it asked forgiveness, but they were still kind of keeping him on the outside. And Paul says, good grief, let's bring him back in. <laughs> it's time to, you know, 
And Paul says a, a cool thing about not allowing him to be overwhelmed by sorrow. That guilt ha it has a very temporary kind of place in our lives. When we feel guilty about something that we do wrong, whether it's you know, a class A up here, <laughs> wrong thing, or just a little minor thing, but guilt has a very temporary role in our lives, and that is just to wake us up. It's a little alarm clock. You know, and some of us hear it. Some of us need bigger alarm clocks. But, but it's, just, it's just to wake us up and get us moving in a new direction. Because that's essentially what repentance is about. It's not just about feeling sorry for our sins and stuff. It's about getting us moving in a new direction. Thinking wise and living wise. And then we're not to carry that anymore. The guilt has done its, done its duty and we're to be done with it uh, rather than carry it around and let it turn into shame. So he says, let's invite this guy back in. Let's, let's respond. But there were a couple things here that uh, jumped out at me. One was verse 14 toward the end of the chapter there. And he talks about, um, or he does talk about comforting him too in verse 7, which was kind of cool. Extending that comfort. But verse 14, Thanks be to God who always, 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 always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one an aroma from death to death to the other an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? And wherever you walk, if you've committed your life to Jesus Christ, if you said, I open up my life, I open up my heart, I open up my lifestyle, I, I say, okay God, free access. One of God's promises is to be that sweet aroma through us doesn't mean that you're a perfect human being. doesn't mean that you follow all of the commandments all the time or, or do the stuff you're supposed to do. It just means that God is faithful and that you've made a primary commitment to God. And that's the primary commitment to give God, to give Jesus full access to your life and to the best of your ability to try to figure what that is, what that means in your life. But once you've made that decision, and that's a life-changing, eternity kind of involving decision, once you've made that decision to give God full access, and you may not even know what that means totally. I mean, you don't in some ways. But all you know is you're handing your life over and you're saying, you direct, you show me what life is all about. And so God comes through and one of the things He does is He comes through and you begin to give off an aroma a sweet-smelling aroma of life all around you. It's not always received as life. Because for those who want to control their lives and want to run their lives on their own, kind of like the Corinthians, whether you call yourselves Christians or not, doesn't matter. If you want to run your life on your own and you're the only person and it all falls on you and it's all about you and all this stuff, guess what? That wonderful, sweet-smelling fragrance of life of connection, of God's love, is going to smell like rotten fish to you because it runs smack into your way of living. And it's going to destroy that. And you're going to try to build it up and prop it up and the whole thing, and it's going to be a threat. It's going to be an enemy to your way of living. So it will smell like death to you. But that's what we need is that breaking up of the walls, the breaking up of our structures, the falling, falling down of the tower of, of Babel. <laughs> we need that in our lives. And as God takes down and, and allows these things to crumble, something new sprouts up. A little tiny bud, a little green bud, pushing through the snow and the ice. Something of life. And we are surprised, like the farmer in Mark chapter 4. We look at the little things popping up and we don't know, where did they come from? 
God planted them in your lives. And you begin to have this wonderful aroma about your life. And it begins, you walk into a room. It's not just about, it's not about church. It's not about this stuff. It's about you being out and about in your family or your friends, strangers, out in the world, wherever you go, God's promise is that your, that aroma of Christ will come through and will affect people, making very real changes in the lives around you. They may not register that, but a Christian, somebody who's a Christ follower, cannot walk into a room any place on this planet and leave that room unchanged. A Christian cannot walk into a room with people and leave that room unchanged. That's the faithfulness of God. That's the promise of Christ, which is always yes. You will leave the yes of Jesus Christ in a room, whether you're aware of it or not. And so much of this stuff is just about waking up to what God is already doing. It's not about us trying to conjure up stuff. That's magic, okay? This is mystery. This is the mystery, the workings of God who is always working, just like Jesus said in John chapter 5, my Father's always working. God doesn't sit down. He doesn't take breaks. He doesn't take holidays. Well, maybe Christmas. No, just kidding. But He's always working. And you are the yes to somebody in every contact that you have during the day. That yes is just flowing through you. You can cooperate with it. You can work with Jesus on this or not. But that doesn't stop the fragrance. And you will get different reactions, but you're not responsible for the reactions. But you are responsible, we go back to communion, to creating capacity for God inside. And it means an absolute, total surrender. It means just saying, okay, God, I'm not going to be a co-pilot. I'm not going to be your... <laughs> driving partner. I'm not going to make you my advice person, my Ann Landers. You have authority in my life. And once you give God authority, the mystery begins to happen. The fireworks begin to happen. And it's all different for all of us. But once you make that choice and you say, okay, God, it's all yours. You show me what it's all about. He will. He will.